For nearly a week, the ultra-large ever-given container ship was wedged across the Suez Canal. And all trade through one of the most vital shipping lanes in the world stopped dead. With no way through, hundreds of ships sat in the Red Sea and the Mediterranean and waited. Within 48 hours of the Ever Given running aground on March 23rd, there was enough oil sat on tankers at the entrance to the Suez Canal to power the UK for a fortnight. Nearly $10 billion worth of trade a day sat idle. Around the ship, dredgers dug sand and mud while tugs raced from across Egypt and abroad to pull the 220,000-ton vessel from the mud banks on which it was jammed. This is Beyond the Headlines. I'm James Haynes Young, and this week we're talking about how global trade stopped when somebody got their tanker stuck in a canal. Before we get started, take a second to hit subscribe in your podcasting app to get all the latest Beyond the Headlines. We're looking at exactly what happened, why it impacted you, and importantly, how we stop it happening again. At just under 400 metres, the ship is as long as the Empire State Building in New York is tall. At 220,000 tonnes, it weighs the same as about 35,000 large African elephants, or 1,400 of the biggest blue whales. The Ever Given is one of the largest container vessels in the world, and it's the largest allowed through the Suez Canal, a 150-year-old man-made channel through which thousands of trade ships pass every year. Early in the morning of March 23rd, it started moving from the Red Sea into the Suez Canal, on its way from Malaysia to Europe's biggest port in Rotterdam. But about 45 minutes after entering the canal at Port Taufik, it ran aground and sat diagonally across the channel. Officials say that heavy winds and a sandstorm and possibly mechanical failure caused the crash, although a formal investigation only began once the ship was free six days later. High winds of up to 140 kilometres per hour and sandstorms are common in Egypt at this time of year, even having its own name, the Hamsin, the 50th, because it lasts around 50 days every spring. Experts believe that the wind hit the side of the towering vessel, forcing the ship off course and into the side of the canal. Here's former Royal Navy captain Jerry Northwood, who spent years in the region and now works with a maritime security firm called Mast. He explains how the crash likely happened. The very large vessel creates more turbulence in through the water, which has an impact on the uh, ability of the vessel to steer in a straight line. And, and what happened to the Ever Given? It may have had some impact. The, the wind direction and the wind strength may have had some impact on it. But essentially what happened was there was an interaction between the vessel and the bank, which caused the vessel to lose steerage way and veer off course and do so in such a way that it ended up impacting the bank on the other side. So it's a straightforward loss of control. It's no different to being in your car, hitting a very, very wet piece of road, aquaplaning and spinning the car. And that's the sort of maritime equivalent of what happened with the Ever Given. Now, remember that the Ever Given is just short of 400 metres long. The Suez Canal is only 286 metres wide at the point at which it got wedged diagonally across. And the Sandy Channel isn't an even depth right across. At the deepest point in the middle, it's around 24 metres, easily deep enough for the Ever Given. But at the edges, it's not even half that depth. It was the stern, or back, and bow, or front, of the ship that got wedged on these shallower banks, while the middle floated in the deeper channel. At the front of these massive container ships is what's called a bulbous, literally a large protruding bulb that helps the ship cut through the water. But when the Ever Given got stuck, it was the giant bulbous that got wedged right into the mud and wouldn't budge. Around the world, millions watched. The internet was flooded with memes. Images of the stuck ship were shared with tags like, think you've had a hard day. After dredgers working around the clock for days shifted thousands of tonnes of mud and sand, one high-tech dredger moved 27,000 cubic metres of sand on its own, they managed to dig the shallow parts of the channel around the ship to 18 metres deep. This should be enough for the Ever Given to float and turn back to the right position. 
Then the 17 tugs, small ships with powerful engines that help tow large vessels or assist them in manoeuvring, and the support ships began to literally yank the container vessel out of the mud. On March 29th, six days after the Ever Given got stuck, it came free. By the morning of March 30th, over 100 of the more than 400 ships waiting at the Suez Canal entrance had passed through. Traders and the channel's operators worked overtime to get global trade moving again. Since the Suez Canal was dug over 150 years ago, it has been a vital shipping route. From the top of the Red Sea, where Egypt meets the Sinai Peninsula, it cuts north through the arid deserts to the Mediterranean at Port Said. Around 12% of all global trade passes through the canal every year. Why? Simple. If you're coming from Asia to Europe or back again, you don't need to sail around the whole of Africa or past the tricky Cape of Good Hope in the southern point. It cuts off about two weeks or nearly 6,000 kilometres from a journey. This is Captain Ranjith Raja, a former merchant navy officer who spent 14 years at sea. He now heads the Middle East and North Africa oil and shipping research for a data company called Refinitiv, based in Dubai. So the additional time uh, that the ship will have to spend at sea in order to uh, kind of do the voyage around the Cape of Good Hope is going to be anywhere between 10 to 12 days, depending on the speed of the vessel. The only differentiating factor is going to be the additional bunker cost that is going to be used for making the transit. We are talking about almost 3,500 or 4,000 nautical miles in excess compared to the transit through the Swiss. And that for, say, a super tanker or for a huge container vessel or like a cape-sized bulk carrier, we are talking about just bunker cost in excess of about $400,000. On average, over 50 ships pass the canal every day. That's around 19,000 ships a year. Although it might seem remote or removed, it's very likely that if you live in Europe or Asia or the Middle East or even parts of America, the Suez will touch your everyday life. In Europe, the petrol in your car most likely comes through the Suez. The products you buy in the shops or the things that you order online made in Asia will almost definitely have. Here's Captain Northwood. There was a very famous case of a, a container vessel back in the early 2000s, I think it was, maybe late, very late 90s. It was delayed at Suez by a storm. And as a consequence, a lot of video game imports from Japan or from the Far East into Europe didn't make it in time for Christmas. So they missed the Christmas market. Going the other way, the same is true. Billions of dollars of products are shipped from Europe to Asia through the Suez. Halfway between, the Suez is also crucial for the Middle East, for products coming from Europe, if you're in the Gulf, or from Asia, if you're in the North African region or the Levant. You might not know it, but the Suez helps keep your lights on, the shelves stocked, and your fridges full. What will this disruption mean? The supply chain is going to be most affected. And it's, it, it's going to cause shortages. And, you know, things are going to be, you know, just enough, just in time economy. There will be items that are being traded between the Far East and Europe or Far East and America that are just not going to, uh, going to make it in time. Or we will just have to take the shortages until they do arrive. It is quite a significant disruption to globalised trade. Having said that, once everything gets going again, things will quickly, fairly quickly recover and we'll get back to normal. And from a Suez Canal point of view, uh, it is a very, very necessary waterway uh, and people will continue to use it. It's also really important for the Egyptian economy. Before the coronavirus pandemic, tariffs brought in $5.8 billion for the Egyptian government in 2019. Over the years, the Suez Canal has been at the centre of international crises. But including the ever given, it's only been closed five times, during accidents, conflicts and blockades. Ships have got stuck before. In 2015, two ships ran aground in dense fog. Before that, the Hong Kong-flagged Okal King Door ran aground and blocked the channel. But never did it take this long to refloat the boats. Why? Size. The Okal King Door is just 93,000 tonnes. That's less than half the size of the Ever Given. Smaller ships are just easier to move. So what's been happening to shipping, and was the Ever Given just too big for the sewers? Well, over the last two decades, container ships have ballooned in size. In 2000, a ship carrying 5,000 container boxes was common. The Ever Given carries 20,000. 
the Ever Given is one of 13 huge container ships of its kind. 11 of them are chartered by Evergreen Maritime. If you saw pictures of the ship, you'd have seen the name painted in huge letters down the side. Here's Captain Raja again talking about the shifts towards larger ships. The major trade routes is between Asia and the US or Asia and Europe. So these are huge consumer markets which drive the demand for the vessels of these size as well because in place of where two ships used to do the runs like say about five, 10 years ago, the one ship is able to carry the same amount of cargo now. A vessel uh, such as the Ever Given can carry about 20,000 TUs of containers at any given point in time. And these are just in like the statistics just staggers when it, when you look at the shipping, how it was operating just about 10 years back. Anything smaller or anything lower, that means you're having several impact across the supply chain. The items are going to reach that much slower or it's going to be that much more expensive because the, it, the ships are going to make that much more uh, runs in order to deliver the same amount of cargo. So which means the final cost is always going to go to the end consumer. So bigger ships just move more stuff, more efficiently, and are therefore cheaper to run. But as Captain Northwood points out, there are also downsides. I think if you want to minimise risk when you're going through something like the Suez Canal, clearly the smaller the vessel, the less likely it is to get into trouble. Because what happened there was quite simply a case of physics. She interacted with the bank and lost her ability to steer, lost control, and, and the rest of it is history. Now, clearly, the bigger the vessel, the more likely that risk. Those large vessels are not going to go away. They're in the market. They are for economies of scale reasons. The shipping companies will continue to want to have that kind of size vessel going backwards and forwards shifting huge numbers of containers, which can then be redistributed from hub ports elsewhere in Europe, America, Far East, wherever. So they're not going to go away. What we have to do is learn how to, perhaps there are some lessons that will come out of this as to how those vessels are driven down the canal and how we might be able to mitigate those risks. It might be to do with wind strengths as to when they should be allowed to go down the canal. The 30 knot wind strengths plus don't occur very often. So maybe actually if there is a risk of high winds, those vessels don't go down the canal. And maybe, you know, things like that, just little tweaks to the, um, the procedures that could be used to make, to reduce the risk. Maybe the use of um, tugs. Maybe the Suez Canal needs a larger size tug that can be deployed with the vessel and connected so that in the event of the vessel losing control of the bow, the tug can immediately do something about it. So there, there might be some things like that, but I don't think we're going to stop using that kind of vessel in the canal just because... This has happened. What we have to do is learn to do is, is learn to be able to conduct the passage of those vessels along the canal more safely. Okay, so ships are getting bigger, and that's not about to change. So what about the sewers? Will Egypt just need to expand it? Well, over the last 150 years since the sewers was first dug, it has been expanded several times. Most recently in 2010. Then in 2015, President Abdel Fattah El Sisi ordered extra legs to be built effectively bypass channels. The idea was twofold. One, it allowed more ships to pass through at a time. And two, if one leg became blocked, you still had a backup route. On the southern stretch, where the Ever Given grounded, there is no such bypass. So, will Egypt now build one? Captain Raja says the problem is where do you build the extra sections? The question is always going to be remaining when and where the second alternative has to be made. Because if you make, say, from the kilometer zero to kilometer 20, and then if the accident happens tomorrow at kilometer 25, then you, there's never going to be an alternate route because these accidents can happen anywhere across through the canal. And unless otherwise there is a through and through transit as a secondary means which can go in and out, it's going to be a difficult uh, or a challenging aspect to plan. It is also about the economic conditions of Egypt, whether they have the resources, whether they have the investments that they can kind of absorb at this point in time in order to warrant or uh, make economic sense out of it. The 2015 expansion of extra sections on the canal cost Egypt about $8 billion. And the question has long been asked if it was economically worth it. So early on March 30th, when the canal was cleared, the ships began to move. But how long will it take to get back to normal? So 50 was the average uh, that we saw based on the 2020 transit data that we had. But we also tried and looked into what is the maximum number of transits that the canal has handled on, on any given day. 
And that's roughly about 90 to 100 ships that has been handled at the peak of the canal's capacity. And that is exactly what we would be expecting the canal to do right after the canal reopens. But the only limitations in this is, although the numbers do reflect that it could be cleared relatively easily, uh, we do need to keep into factor the tidal variations that will be required for some of the bigger vessels and also the various constraints in terms of the physical capacities. You need the tugs to escort each of the ships. You need pilots, at least two pilots on board at any given point in time for navigating these vessels across the canal. Shipping companies will be looking at the incident, though, and they may reassess how they do things. Here's Captain Northwood. I think anybody who's involved in supply chain management will be looking once again at their risks, what risks they're carrying in terms of their supply chain. So, for instance, if your production uh, and sourcing of materials or production is from the Far East and you're, you're doing this assembly in Europe or America, you might well think about where exactly you're getting it from, what routes it's taking, and whether actually you might want to ship some of that sourcing to other parts of the world and not be entirely dependent on one area. So I think anyone who's involved in supply chain management uh, at either end of the, uh, the world, whether it's from the eastern side or the, or the western side, people will probably be dusting down their risk management grids and thinking about whether they need to do things slightly differently. So Captain Northwood's pointed out that the ships of this size aren't going away. But he suggests there are lessons to be learned in how they should navigate the Suez more safely and how companies can rethink how they operate so they're not so hard hit if this kind of accident happens again. There is, however, a question of who is responsible and who will foot the bill for the claims made for lost revenue. The Fitch Ratings Agency warned that the reinsurance industry faces a large loss event from the blockage of the Suez Canal. Here's Captain Raja. The next challenge is going to be the claims. Uh, who's going to be bearing this whole cost that has resulted out of this? There are about 370 vessels almost that are waiting, that are losing their revenues on a daily basis. Suez Canal is losing almost $15 million on a daily basis just in terms of the transit revenue that they've lost. So it's more about who's going to be absorbing these costs or losses that has resulted as a, on, on the back of this incident. For a week in March 2021, the world was glued to the Suez, while the Ever Given was stuck. The impact rippled out even after the ship was free. But with the world only becoming more interconnected, mega cargo ships able to feed the just-in-time supply chains from China to Cork and keep the global economy moving will only become more important, even if the risk of another accident is always there. The canal has been blocked in the past. You know, it had long periods during the Arab-Israeli wars where there was there was no canal at all. The canal was um, was was blocked up for many years. People had to find an alternative. So the world knows how to do that. It just has to adapt. But but once the canal is back up and running, people will want to use it. And it's a great waterway. You know, it does it does what it uh, is meant to do. The problem is, of course, that we need to recognise that we are putting larger and larger vessels through. The um, Ever Given was a vessel that could not have gone through the Panama Canal. It's too big, but it can go through Suez. But we probably need to be a little bit more careful as to what the real the real risks are there, because she's not the first container vessel to go aground in the canal, more than just aground. She's completely blocked it in the process. That is, having happened once, it's quite possible it could happen again. Thanks this week to Captain Ranjith Raja and to Captain Jerry Northwood. If you enjoyed this episode, you can subscribe and get all the latest Beyond the Headlines in your podcasting app. While you're there, if you can leave us a review, it can make a real difference. We were produced this week by Aisha Khan and Arthur Edison.